Yes, hello, it's Joe here, live, finally, for Joyrider TV. Apologies for that small bit of technical lack of wizardry there from my end. Um, so, hello and greetings from Vasiliki Lefkus, Greece, where somebody has turned up the heat by a few small degrees, where we are in for, as I'm sure you are aware, some scintillating Q and A on the topic of catamaran sailing and possibly a few other bits thrown in as well. Uh, just like to say hello to everybody who is patiently tuned in. Uh, say hello to Nick in Ohio, USA. Hello to Andy and Adele in Australia. Great to have you with us. It must be very, what would it be? Very early in the morning where you are or late at night either way. And hello to Declan in Stockholm, Sweden. Hello to Toot in Texas. This is great to have so many people with us. So Andy and Adele, very early Saturday morning in Brisbane. Looking forward to hearing some expert knowledge from the guru. Well, good luck with that. We'll see how that goes. We've got Joaquin from Five. Hi, Joe from Five. Well, there we are. I believe Joachim is in Argentina. And um, incidentally, if you didn't catch it before, um, Joachim has actually set up for us um, a Discord server, which um, means we have finally got somewhere where you are able just to head over there and chat whenever you fancy it. So that is really pretty cool and so much so that I am just even as we speak sticking the link in the live chat to the discord server I'll also put it in the video description below for those of you who are watching later on and not live but um basically what we're trying to do with this is have a facility where people are traveling away from their normal place. And let's say you are going to Galveston Bay, Texas. Well, why wouldn't you? So if you were heading to Galveston Bay, Texas for some sort of boring work thing you've got going on nearby, you get on the Discord server and you put in there, I'm heading to Galveston Bay, Texas on whenever it would be uh, March the 7th. Um, would anybody be willing to take me for a spin on your boat? And this is what we're trying to do with this Discord server is make it a place where you guys, the global Joyrider TV community, can reach out to each other to hook up and meet up. And then say you've gone to Galveston Bay, Texas um, and got a good sale there then whoever went sailing with you, maybe they'll say, well, I happen to be coming to, um, I don't know, Miami, Florida um, at the end of June. Uh, could I come for a spin with you? And before you know it, you've got more friends than you did before and friends with boats. That is always a good thing. So that is what is going on there. Uh, all right. Also checking in, we've got Lee in Macon, Georgia, USA. Great to have you with us. Um, I'll just check in with everyone before I get on to Declan's first question. We've got Paul on board in Italy. Hello, Paul. Great to have you with us. Not long now until I get the first one of these juicy new Hobie 16s assembled um, on the Wild Wind Beach. But I was going to do it yesterday. However, there's a bit of weather forecast for the weekend. And I thought, it's probably but better not to have a, a new boat sat on the beach when the weather's not going to be very nice and it might get wet. We wouldn't want that now. So that is currently on hold. We've got Mr. Tony KP in Denmark. Great to have you with us. Uh, Jens is also on board in Germany. This is really nice that all of you guys are on board. Thanks for tuning in. This is very good. All right. I don't know if I've said hello to Toot yet. Hello, Toot. Uh, always a pleasure. Never a chore. Um, 
All right. So I'll come on to your question in a second. I'm just saying hello to everyone. We've got Jamie Bravo on board. Uh, good morning, everybody. Show on snow on the Oregon coast yesterday and sudden, sunny and chilly today. Ouch. Yeah, this, I think here in, in Greece, um, in this part of Greece anyway, we are past, hopefully, the coldest bit and just in time for the startup team of Ollie and Ash who are coming out tomorrow. Um, you know, we like to turn up the temperature for the guys who are coming out to work. All right, we've got Hemmings Detail, um, who is also keen to talk about trapezing. We will do that. All right, so um, uh, Toot says, incidentally, for those who are traveling, uh, Lake Buchanan, Texas, has a couple of extra Hobie 16s to loan to guest sailors. Nice. All right, Declan says, snow in Los Angeles today. Crazy weather these days. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so much so that some of the trees here have only just lost their leaves from last year and it's getting on for time for the leaves to start growing again. How does that work? I'm not a scientist or, an, or into that sort of stuff, but I am confused as to how the trees are going to cope with that. All right, so back to question one, which is from Declan, who says, can we talk about tiller extensions? They are so expensive to replace and sadly have broken a few at this point. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to say what we do at Wild Wind Sailing Holidays because we get through a lot of tiller extensions. We probably, on average, break about, I don't know, 15 maybe in a summer. Uh, so if we were to buy um, actual tiller extensions from any manufacturer, even somebody selling cheap ones, they're still going to be still going to mount up to a lot of money. So what we do is, depending on the type of boat, we buy bare either aluminium tube or carbon tube. So the carbon tube lengths, well, uh, we get in at two meters fifty. And um, it does work out pretty inexpensive. I think uh, as of so far, we've actually been importing our carbon tube from the UK from a company called Carbon Fibre Tubes. That's how we found them. Um, and they're really good, really strong. And I think for a two and a half metre length, it's about 60 euros um, for carbon tube. Um, that is a lot cheaper than spending uh, over 200 euros on an actual made tiller extension. Um, and then what we do is take the fittings off the old broken ones and work out the scheme for how we're going to fit the new fittings, uh, the old fittings to the new tube. So what we do pay attention to is... If this is the tube and this is the end where we're going to put the connection. So um, on the Hobies, uh, um, what most of them use is like a bit of um, this bit is like a solid aluminium bar um, with a hole drilled through it where the clevis pin goes. But this would be the same if you were using a, a rubber uj as well which would look something like that it would be the same what you have to do is somehow make it so the in well when you buy the tube pay attention to the inside diameter of the tube and make sure it is the right size for taking whatever you're going to shove up there to attach to the boat um and then what we would do is glue it and bolt it. So we'll put some epoxy inside to glue it as we push it in. And then we put, we drill it and put a bolt through here. Now we're using a bolt so that we can really be quite delicate when we're tightening it up. 
because if you do use a pot rivet in the um, carbon, then the pressure of the rivet pulling could actually crack the carbon. And we don't want that now. Um, but what we would also do, um, because we've got the facilities um, from many, many old snapped tiller extensions, is we would take a length about 15 centimetres of thicker tube and epoxy that on the outside of the new tube. So we've got a reinforced section there. So we're making this section down uh, by the universal joint as strong as possible. That is what we're doing. Uh, with the aluminium tubes, we're using those more so on the Hobie 16s, or in fact, we're using those all the time on the Hobie 16s. Two reasons. One is that they are way, way, way cheaper um, than the ones you'd buy from Hobie Cat. And the second reason is those fiberglass ones from Hobie Cat. If, um, let's say, the person helming the boat falls off, doesn't let go of the tiller extension with those fiberglass ones. They do snap, but they'll stay in one piece largely. But if you then you assume it hasn't snapped and you grab it, the fiberglass splinters you get in your hand are absolutely horrible. Uh, whereas with the aluminium one, if somebody grabs hold of it for too long, it will bend but then they can be bent back straight a number of times. So that is our strategy for tiller extensions. But of course, if you want a really, really nice tiller extension and you want to treat yourself, um, then check out Malcheski Composites um, and get the Pro Joyrider tiller extension from Malcheski Composites. Now they are something special. Oh, yes, they're professionally made, but significantly more expensive than, of course, sourcing the tube yourself. All right. So who else is on board or what are we going to talk about next? I hope that helps there, Declan. Um, but basically find the tube inside diameter being the most important Uh yeah, so Toot and Hemmings Detail says, can you explain the best way to get out on the wire for the first time? Yes. All right, so if we talk about going out on the trapeze first as the crew, um, either way, whether it's the crew or the helm, what we want to do before you go out onto the trapeze is get the boat on a steady course. So the steadiest course, wind from the top, is we want to be on an upwind course or maybe a close reach. So we're going to be sailing in this general direction. Now, the reason we're sailing in this general direction uh, rather than on a reach across the wind is because it's much slower. Um, we're well powered up on this point of sail. We should have, if there's enough wind, we should have a little bit of heel on and having a little bit of heel on where the boat, the windward side of the boat is just starting to lift makes it so much easier. You want to have that just lifting slightly, not even coming out of the water, but just lifting so that you know you've got that power on. And then on that point of sail also, we're going a bit slower, which makes it a lot easier to keep the boat really nice and stable. So we are looking for stability before going out on the trapeze for the first time. There we go. And also, on the upwind point of sail, we can control the power quite a lot, although it's not the fastest necessarily, but um, we can control the power with the steering a lot more, which is going to be a lot easier than using the main sheet a lot if 
we're trying to get out on the trapeze for the first time, either the helm or the crew. All right. So then what we would want to do, I don't know if I've ever done this without actually having a boat to demonstrate on, is um, let's have a close up of. This is the windward side of the boat. So, and there is the shroud. The easiest place to go out on the trapeze. Uh, so firstly, as the crew is just behind the shroud. So you wanna be sat on the hull with your legs. Over, this is the trampoline, by the way, in case you hadn't got that. Um, with your legs over the trampoline like that. And you can then hook on to um, the trapeze ring. Uh, what you want with the height of your trapeze is so that when you hook on, you have to kind of lift yourself up a little bit to hook on. That's going to make it the easiest possible for you. Also, make sure your trapeze harness is done up really tight. The most important part of the trapeze harness to get really tight is the bit that goes directly onto the spreader bar. That is very important. If that's not tight, it is much more difficult because it's like, it's just more difficult. I'm not gonna explain why, not just now. Okay, so then once you're in this position and you're hooked on, um, for the very general, this is how you're gonna do it. What you wanna do is your front hand, I'm just picturing that I can draw this nicely. I don't know if I can. Front hand on the handle that goes up the mast. And then back hand. This picture is getting worse all the time. Back hand on the side of the boat. And basically, the further back you put your back hand, that is going to give you more space and make it much easier for you. So if um, the helm is sitting here, you could ask them just to shuffle in board a little bit so that then your hand can go directly behind them um, without accidentally grabbing the buttocks of the skipper, uh, which you don't want to do. Um, and then once you, you're there, front hand on the handle, back hand on the side of the boat, you can then shuffle outboard until your front foot is gonna go up on the side. Now, this is the beauty of having your back hand really far back because what you can do is really twist to get into that position. So if there is your foot knee bent, just um, where's the other leg? Other leg there there's the body, hand all the way back here, front hand, handle. Um, all right, I can't draw this. I think I've just established that. Um, but by having your back hand far back, you can really twist. So you're not going straight out on the boat. You're going out at an angle like that, which means that you don't have to be able to get the knee of your front foot to your ear to be able to get it to the side of the boat easier. And then once you're in that position, front foot and back hand, it's then, if you haven't done it before, it's a bit of a leap of faith because you've just got to give it one good push out with your leg and your hand and bring the other leg out onto the side of the boat. And then once you're on the side of the boat, have your legs quite wide apart, basically, the, fit, the wider you have your feet apart on the side of the boat, that makes you more stable, um, which is what we're looking for, especially in the early stages. So get the feet really wide apart. And then um, what we can do just to um, make it a bit easier still is take the jib sheet out with us so they, uh, I'm not going to try drawing it. 
Um, so then once you're out, you've got the jib sheet in your front hand, something very nice to hold on to. And then if you can persuade the, the helm to pass you the traveler line going to the back, then that means you've got a rope in each hand, like um, one to the back, one to the front, feet nice and wide apart. You should be feeling very stable indeed. So that is how you are going to get out on the trapeze the first time. If you find it difficult, then if it if it seems really hard, then perhaps it's because the boat is too flat um, and it just needs a little bit more power to lift the hull slightly. Um, we're not trying to get the hull out of the water, but just to have just the smallest amount of angle, because otherwise, as you push out, you're going to get hit by the waves and um, it's going to be difficult. Um, yeah, so that would be how you're going to move out onto the trapeze the first time. What I would, of course, highly recommend is reviewing uh, the trapezing videos that are on the Joyrider TV channel because they go through it in much better detail than I can do just here. Um, so definitely check that out there. Um, yeah, and I think that is about the size of it for now. If you've got any follow-up questions, please shoot fire away. Um, but there we go. All right. All right, hold on. Oh, I've got, there's a lot in the live chat. I'm having to scroll back. All right, scrolling back. Um, all right, we've got Jeff on board. Hello, Jeff. Sorry, I haven't to scroll back. There is a lot in the chat. And not only that, I've got a lot of preloaded questions as well. Uh, so we are in for the long haul, everybody. I hope you are strapped in tight and ready and you haven't got to nip off to work. All right. So Jeff says, good morning from Ontario, Canada. There's usually a cruise spot available in Orilla. Very nice. Yeah. Get involved on the Discord server um, and um, put some details on there um, so that people know if they're heading over to Orilla, um, there is a good chance. All right, Jens says, me and Marcus heading to Summer Bay in Eastern. We want to take some grip tape and foot strap to prepare the cats there. They are slippery. Do you have a favorite grip tape for that or a tip? Yeah, um, all that I can recommend is what I've used here on the boats here. And what that is, is called Nautix. Um, N-A-U-T-I-X fun pads actually designed for windsurfers and surfers but it's rather than like grip tape like the paper stuff which is a bit like sandpaper what we're what works the best is the rubber stuff with a good deep tread fairly soft compound if you've got a soft compound rubber grip on the side of your boat then it means it will marry up very nicely. These just arrived to the Zero Shoes Aqua Pro X. Yes, thank you very much, Zero Shoes, for my new pair. Um, but yeah, they'll work very nicely with those bad boys or anything else. But that is what I would do for grip tape. All right, Jeff says, Mr. Paint Buddy equals cheap tiller extensions. There we go. I'm assuming that must be a Canadian supplier, but check it out. Do a Google search, see what it says. All right, we've got Colonel Failure on board. Um, he's tagging in with a super sticker. Nice to have you on board, Colonel Failure. Colonel Bro Failure is, of course, my brother, um, and he has a fine channel right here on the YouTube uh, topic is simulators on video games, simulations of things that you would do in real life. 
if you did them, such as driving trains and tractors and stuff like that. So if you're into a bit of um, tractor driving simulator, it's very good. Uh, check out the Colonel Failure channel. Thanks very much for the donation there. Uh, that will buy a pork pie. Lovely. Love a pork pie. All right. Declan says awesome tip. We'll check out the carbon tube option. Very good. We've got Chris Galveston Bay, Texas, probably on board some sort of um, working boat. Great to have you with us, Chris, as always. All right. We've got Ollie Smith. He's part of the setup team that are coming out this weekend. Uh, just in time, in fact, for the Lefkus Island Carnival. Oh, yes. This carnival is a procession through Lefkus Town, ending up with um, free food and wine. Very nice. Um, but the next day, not very nice. But anyway, uh, beers are in the fridge. Andy and Adele says, great tip for reinforcing the end of the tiller. Yeah, it certainly helps. And what it helps with, as well as everything, is your peace of mind knowing that you've done everything that you possibly can uh, to prevent the tiller extension from breaking. All right. Uh, Declan says, I've got good, I've had good results with shrink wrap, vinyl tube, cable wrap to cover bolts on the tiller extensions. Yeah, nice. Yeah, let's get those covered. Um, we generally, because we don't, carry a stock of shrink wrap unfortunately we're a little bit too tight here um we either use self amalgamating tape that's the tape that bonds to itself or just electrical tape if we are short yeah ollie says i've snapped a carbon stick unpleasant on the hands yeah definitely that's the problem with the carbon sticks is when they break usually they usually break clean in half uh, one half usually ends up in the sea, never to be seen again. Um, and the other half uh, leaves a jagged mess of horrible carbon spikes. Um, so be careful if you're going to break a carbon tiller extension. Ah, Declan says, if I win the speed stick, I will treat myself to our Mal Malcheski Composites Pro Joyrider tiller extension. Great choice. All right, we've got Max on board. Hello, Max. Uh, Max always greets all of the cat sailors. Uh, he's coming from a no-wind Lake Simsee, Germany. Uh, so I've got time for a great Q&A as always. Yeah, Max. And I think one of the pre-loaded questions is actually from your sailing partner, is it Andre? Yeah. Uh, so we'll be coming on to that shortly. Um, all right, Toot says, <laughs> this is good. We've, this is called banter. Uh, Declan, if you win the speed stick, I'll pitch in for your new tiller extension. All right, so put it in the, uh, the live chat or the comments or on the, um, what's it called? The Discord server. Who is willing to pitch in to buy the winner of the speed stick if it's a Hobie getaway? with Declan on board. If Declan wins the speed stick, who will put in 10 euros towards a Malcheski Composites to extension? We just need like 25 people to get involved there. And uh, Declan, you'd better start waxing those hulls. Uh, let's not talk about waxing the hulls though. We did that last week. Nice, all right. So just I'm just kind of skimming through the live chat now because um, there's so much to get through in today's edition. All right. So Colonel Failure says on the topic of getting out on the trapeze um, is committing. That is the secret weapon. A big old push from your front hand and then land it way easier than being timid. Yeah, that is a solid tip. Um, if you don't commit, it's going to be very hard. In fact, you're going to find it so that you're not actually strong enough to get out. You've really just got to throw yourself out there and making sure you are hooked on, of course. 
Nice. All right, Toot says, my drawing looks like a man overboard drill. Yeah, he's still holding on, though. He's hanging on there. <laughs> Hemmings Detail says, I can hang that drawing on the refrigerator after school. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's not my best. In fact, I, I think most of the time, the pictures aren't too bad, but that one just tested my ability a bit too much. All right, so um, Stefan is on board. Hello, Stefan. He says, when going out on the trapeze on a Hobie 20 with benches, can you think of a better way to get out than what we're doing? We're trapezing on the hull in front of the benches and then hopping out to get out. No, I would say, and this is going to be a good picture. In fact, in all of the time that Joyrider TV has existed, we have never once talked about how you get on the trapeze on a boat which has the big wings. So thank you, Stefan, for a brand new question. So there's the hull. And there is the big wing. Uh, by the way, while I'm drawing, feel free just to investigate the super sticker button. It's just at the bottom. Looks like a an outline of a dollar bill. Uh, anyway, so just uh, anyway. So what we'll do. This is what I would do to get out on the trapeze from a winged boat is sitting on the side. This is not to scale quite clearly. Um, and then from that position, I would actually do exactly the same as if I was sitting on the hull. So I would take one foot out onto the side uh, and the front foot back hand thing where you put your back hand on the whole front foot on the side of the boat. If that feels completely wrong, like the wrong way round, it's just a guideline. So switch it round and do it the other way round. If that feels wrong, it could be that um, the boat is sailing on a very upwind course and perhaps the trim is a little bit too far back. So if the boat is digging the stern in at all that's going to make you feel like you're going to fall backwards so like on a um a smaller boat especially you could try going out back foot first which means you put the opposite hand on the hull but again here um have the front foot let's say front foot just to yeah you know um front foot and back hand as far apart as possible and that means, again, you're going to really twist when you get out. So you don't have to do those contortionist uh, contortions uh, to get your foot on the side. And then once you're there, then again, it's that commitment really boost out. And that is how I would do it. Now, whether you've got the benches or just an, a boat without benches on it, what I would do is just spend... 10 minutes, if that, in the boat park before you put the boat in the water. Make sure if you need to put the rig tension on first. Uh, make sure the boat isn't sat on something nasty that's going to damage the hulls. So and make sure the boat is stable as well, not on the launching trolley. And practice a few times on land before going out onto the water. When you do your on land practice, it is actually going to be a bit more difficult than on the water because on land, the boat is going to be flat and not with any heel on. So because the boat's flat, it is going to be more difficult to get out on the trapeze. So practice on land. And then when you come to do it on the water, it will all feel a bit more natural. I hope that helps. All right, Ollie Smith. <laughs> says most issues cat sailing can be sorted with more power rock and roll 
Yeah, um, definitely. All right. OK, so Stefan says works OK for the crew, but not for the helm. Yeah, I can imagine uh, if you're going forwards to get on trapezing off the hull, uh, that's not very practical for the helm at all. All right, Declan says you must save your screen drawings. Yeah, I think so. They are they're very good. All right, Hemmings Detail, another question coming in, says, I think I need to replace my gudgeons. And if you didn't know, the gudgeons, if we're looking at the back of the boat here, so this is the hull, the gudgeons are these bits on the back of the hull um, where the rudder will attach. So maybe you've got a rudder pin that goes through there. Um, and uh, sorry, his detail says how much play is too loose. Any play at all is too loose. There should be zero play in those bad boys. Um, so this requires immediate attention. Um, what you might be able to do, hopefully, is to hold holding the gudgeons on. There's going to be some sort of bolts like that maybe like that and hopefully you can just tighten those bad boys up um and that will sort out the problem um yeah let's go with that as a starter uh tighten those up you don't need to replace them just tighten them up if the uh there is too much play between the gudgeon and the rudder pin or the pin tool, then you need to look at doing some bushing. Um, I've done several videos on the topic of bushing. So um, just put in a Google search, Hobie Rudder Service, everything will be there. I rank quite well, I think. All right. So um, Joachim says, um, What does he say? Um, art for post, for the posterity. Yes, absolutely. Thanks very much, by the way, to everyone who's tuning in with a super sticker. So, Stefan, thank you very much. And Declan, thank you very much indeed. Um, and Hemmings Detail, thank you very much as well. Uh, this is very nice. This is all going, by the way, towards a new computer so that when this one dies, which unfortunately it is on the cards, then I will have something else ready to uh, start using when this one goes. Because uh, unfortunately at the moment, if this one dies, then um, there'll be a bit of a radio silence from my end. So thanks very much to everybody who, um, who's who been supporting Joyrider TV. I really do appreciate it. And that is very nice. All right. So Jeff says, any advice for staying on the trapeze in big ones? Crewing Prindle 18-2, the Everlades Challenge in March. All right. Yes. Yeah, so two things for um, greater stability in waves. The main one is you want to make it as easy as possible to sail the boat. So what does that mean? Make your trapeze line shorter. Yet it doesn't look as racy and you won't be able to fly the hull as high. But if you're flying the hull so high, that you feel like you're gonna fall into the boat, then you're flying the hull too high. You don't want to be flying the hull that high in the first place. But by having your trapeze line uh, shorter, like perhaps we'll call a normal position, would be more like this. Um, it means you're less likely to get hit by the waves. And that is going to make it so much easier. The second thing uh, to make it easier when you're trapezing in waves is keep your feet reasonably wide apart. You know, um, 
as you get used to those conditions more, you'll feel um, whether having your feet that wide apart, if you feel absolutely rock solid with your feet like there, try bringing them in a little bit, see how that feels. And if you're like, oh, no, 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 uh, put them wider apart again. And then um, have, and like I said before, have a rope in both hands, jib sheet at the front, uh, traveler line in the backhand, and there you are really going to be as stable as you possibly can be. There we go. All right. Oh, so um, I think Toot is responding to the earlier question about grip on the side of the boat. Murray's, uh, Murray's probably the best place to pick up your catamaran sailing equipment in the USA, by the way, um, is selling, God, I keep losing which one I'm reading, uh, 3M Surface. That is perfect. Uh, Toot uses it on the Hobie 17 and the Getaway. Now, how about Toot and Declan going head to head on the speed stick on Getaways? How about that? I think we all want to see that, see how that pans out. Nice. All right. So, yeah, good point from Chris there. Also for the trapezing in waves is bend your knees. Use your knees like suspension. Don't have your legs locked out, but um, have your knees a little bit softer. And you will find whether you're further to the back or the front of the boat, one of your knees is going to have to be more bent than the other one, unless you are completely neutral, trapezing below the point on the mast where the trapeze lines are coming from. There we go. All right, we got Ward on board. Sorry about that rhyming, by the way. I think this is the first time we've had you with us, Ward. But thanks for tuning in. Uh, thanks for joining in with the live chat. By the way, what are your thoughts on wearing a dry suit on a cat? Isn't it too loose? The North Sea can be pretty cold. In, in fact, wearing a dry suit on a catamaran is pretty commonplace, um, especially in Northern Europe, especially, uh, I would say, 90% of the people going cat sailing are wearing dry suits. So, yes, dry suit, good plan. Um, just put your uh, base layer underneath uh, some sort of fleecy stuff. And that is really going to make the biggest difference to extending your sailing season so that you can get out when it is colder. All right. So, Ryan, uh, there in uh, Maui, Hawaii, says, how's it, everyone? Uh, the fleet is growing. Oh, my goodness. You're not going to believe it. But Ryan has got himself a getaway. Do you know what we're having on the speed stick? The getaway challenge. And I'm going to say right now, whoever wins, this is with a minimum number of entries of three getaways on the speed stick. Whoever finishes the season in first place, first getaway on the speed stick is going to get a custom Hobie Getaway Joyrider t-shirt as a prize. How about that? So get involved on the speed stick if you've got a getaway, especially. Um, also, if you happen to sail a wasp, the foiling dinghy, we've got our first wasp on the speed stick. Um, it's like, if you don't know, the wasp it is like a more budget-friendly version of the international moth. Very quick uh, foiling and... Um, I'm expecting more wasps to be joining the speed stick. So there we are. Uh, so Joachim says, I'm on board for the tiller extension for Declan's getaway. <laughs> if he wins, that seems like a good bet. But maybe we could chip in to do it for anyone who wins. For whoever wins. Yeah, OK. All we need, I think, is, is 25 people to chip in. So... Uh, Let's um, let's have a thing on the Discord server for whoever's going to chip in. But perhaps this should just be the prize for the Hobie Getaway class winner. Yeah, there's 
this getaway class is getting bigger by the minute. So uh, watch out. All right. So uh, thanks very much, by the way, to Mr. Tony KP for chipping in with the super sticker. Also, um, very kind. I really appreciate the support there. Uh, Hemmings Detail says, I'm looking for something that to prevent keel damage, sliding the boat up and down the beach. Any suggestions for inexpensive keel guards? Yeah, um, what we are talking about here is what I would um, use if I was going to be sliding the boat up and down the beach a lot, depending on the type of boat, of course is get yourself a bit, this will be as inexpensive as it comes, a bit of uh, plastic guttering. Uh, for those who are not from the English speaking department, this is gonna be one of the better drawings of the day. You may be thinking, hold oh, on, that looks like a house. That's because it's a house. So what you have on houses is running along here. You have like a U-shaped piece that runs along there. And then there'd be one going down like that. This bit here is called guttering. And if you get a piece of guttering like that, that will fit under your boat. And then you can slide the boat up and down the beach on that guttering. Um, making it much easier, uh, much better for the hulls when they're being slid on the boat. If you put some holes in the ends of the guttering, put on in some ties of some description with clips, it can be quite a good solution. So that is what I would suggest. So if this was, where, where are we? I'll draw it in the house. So if this was the hull like this, guttering would sit like that. And then your hull is protected while it's on the beach. OK, all right. All right. So we've got Jan Leo on board, the tornado sailor from Germany. He says, I hear you talking about new computer. I recently upgraded from a Dell XPS 17 to a used M1 MacBook Pro. Highly recommend it. Yeah, I'm using an old Intel MacBook Pro at the moment. And um, what I am going to do, I believe in the trade, you call it future proofing, because what happens is all of the new technology that comes out with the new cameras, the um, telemetry, um, the editing software, everything, as that advances, what I found, because my computer's from, I think, 2013, so it's knocking on a bit, um, is it can no longer handle. Back in the day, it was fine, but now it has a little moment every time I try to do anything juicy. So um, what I'm going to look at is, um, I'm thinking of the new Mac M2 Mac Mini Pro, which um, seems to be extremely capable, especially for the price. And that should still be capable in five, maybe more years down the line, which um, I think with a computer, that's pretty good going. So that's what I'm thinking at the moment. All right. We've got Scott dropping it in the slot just on long enough to give a shout out to Ben and his team. Oh, here we go. Uh, Salt City Sailing for their great work on my new custom Gromit Hobie 16 trampoline. Nice. I don't think there's much left on Scott's boat, which is actually original. Uh, but um, lovely job. So Salt City Sailing for very nice trampolines in the US. All right. Declan says getaway challenge accepted. Uh, Toot says we use strips of PVC to rest the holes on the beach. Nice. Uh, Joachim says I sometimes use those floating noodles, but I haven't tried to move the boat around on them yet. Um, 
I think you definitely um, wouldn't be sliding the boat on the noodles. Uh, I think the the PVC guttering uh, is a good option. And the guttering is good because it's already cut in half. If you get PVC pipe, then you have to cut it in half yourself. Mm. All right. So finally, time to go on to the preloaded questions. Before I do, so yeah, so if I could ask, I hate to say it, but no further questions in the live chat, please. Um, because we've been going for 50 minutes and I've still got a load of preloaded. Um, but at this point, uh, for those watching later, I'm just going to take a short commercial break. Mm. This tastes even, bot even better from a Joyrider TV bottle. We're not using the plastic. We're in reusable metal bottle. Keeps your drink nice and cold. Very good. Okay. So, um, <laughs> elevator music from Toot, as always. So, I hope I'm not, I might be speaking a little bit too quickly for those of you who are not um, native English speakers. I apologize for that, but I've just got a lot to get off my chest today. All right. First question is from Ahitchu. Ahit. Oh, that sounds like Ahitchu in Scottish, um, who says, what do you think about the Texas 200? I'm sure there's some people in the live chat who might know a thing or two about the Texas 500, 200. But I've looked it up. I've actually got it up here at the moment. Uh, the Texas 200 is a raid type event. What that is, is a long distance event where the boats sail over a long stretch of distance, but doing a shorter distance each day, stopping in a different place each day. Now, I hate you. Uh, asks, would it be crazy to do it on a Hobie 16? I would say it would be crazy not to do it on a Hobie 16. I would really like to have a pop at that because it looks like an absolutely great stretch of coastline um, where, um, where you could uh, sail down. This is going to be absolutely fantastic. Yes. So I would pursue that idea. Do really take um, a lot of care with all of your safety um, safety precautions. Like what, just think about every single thing that could go wrong and use the two words, what if, like the Coldplay song. Um, what if I fall off the boat? What if my mast falls down? What if my trapeze wire breaks? What if I break my tiller extension? So loads of what ifs and then think, all right, we're going to do something about that what if so that if it does happen, we're going to be all right. But yes, and yes. All right, I'll just back to the live chat for a second. Uh, we have got Lobo Viking in uh, Brazil. Your videos are really helpful. Thanks. Thanks very much for tuning in and letting me know. Um, it's always nice to know that, um, that people around the world are finding the videos useful and hopefully entertaining, maybe even informative. Hmm. So Toot says the Texas 200 wins from some, from <laughs> I, think, I think the winds are in a whole range of things be prepared to uh, drop the mainsail and just charge it out on the jib, maybe, if you need to. All right. Lobo Viking says, how many people can sail on a Hobie 14? Yeah, it's a very low volume boat, the Hobie 14. So sailing with any more on the Hobie 14, rather than the number of people, let's look at the amount of weight and I wouldn't want to put more than about 110 kilos. Let's just put that into the supercomputer. 110 kilos, which is 0.12 short tons. 
um, or 242 pounds. Um, so n not much more than 242 pounds of weight on a Hobie 14. And when you move forwards or backwards on the 14, it's going to really make a big difference, which is one of the things that makes it so much easier as a single handed boat. All right. So next preloaded question. And this one comes from Matt, who says, how do you keep your knees from being worn down to raw meat on the trampoline? This is a big question and a real issue that we see so much of during the summer season at Wildwind Sailing Holidays. The problem is, why is it happening? It's not the fault of the trampoline. Um, it's the fault of having unconditioned knees. Your knees will get tougher over time. But what people are doing uh, when they come somewhere hot like this is they're going from sailing all the time wearing maybe a full wetsuit, maybe even a dry suit, um, but certainly with the knees covered all the time. And then suddenly they come out uh, on holiday somewhere hot. They're just going sailing in shorts, uh, knees exposed, and they're doing a lot of sailing. So their knees are taking a lot of punishment. The best thing you can do if you want to sail bare need is by gradually building up to it or spending some time with your knees out in many other situations, like in the gym, uh, perhaps if you're doing some yoga or something, just get your knees out whenever you can, rub them on the floor to toughen them up a bit. Because uh, for me, by the time I get to doing a lot of sailing, um, come like mid-May, my knees have already got accustomed and sort of built up enough so they don't get really raw. But like when I went to Mauritius a few years ago, in the middle of winter, I went from no sailing, wearing trousers every day to sailing in shorts. And after one day, my knees were absolutely toasted. So it is a good question. So there we go. Uh, but that doesn't actually address the problem. The best answer to the problem is either wear a, uh, like a long john wetsuit with long legs or a cut down uh, wetsuit, which just covers the knees. If you've got an old wetsuit, cut the knees off the old wetsuit and wear them as knee pads or even um, buy some knee pads. Funnily enough, I've been researching knee pads this week and there are a lot out there. The best value knee pads out there are Gull, G-U-L. Uh, they come in at about £25 for a pair and they make a huge difference. But um, yeah, knee pads or a, some sort of long-legged wetsuit to as a barrier there. All right, so just back into the live chat briefly. Uh, Toot says back on the Texas 200, they sail everything down there from homemade to Hobies and everything in between. Lots of videos on YouTube about the 200. Very good. All right, so next in the preloaded, and this one comes from. So I'm just reading the name. It's, uh, I believe, of Spanish descent. Dagoberto Ruben Argulo Gonzalez. Thanks for the preloaded question. Um, oh, I should read the question, I suppose. Uh, so I, can I, if I could just call you Ruben, uh, that would be um, the best for me. Older model Hobie 16. When using the tiller, there is a lot of resistance and it's pulling. Also, when the boat is in the wind and you let go of the tiller, the boat goes straight up into the wind. The rudder has a nut and bolt system used to regulate them, but I don't know the best position to reduce this effect. Or could it be anything else like adjusting the mast? Well, you've hit the nail on the head. 
that sorry i'll just summarize the question massive amounts of what we call weather helm what weather helm is is when you're sailing along you're fighting the rudders all the time you're pulling on the stick as hard as you can to keep the boat going in a straight line. Now, it would be to have it that bad is not going to be related to the setup of the mast. Um, this is going to be related to the rudders. So let's draw a picture. So if we've got the back of the boat, And then this is our rudder blade. What we want to do to reduce the amount of load in the rudder is get this as far forwards as we possibly can. So if you've got the adjustment bolt on top of your tiller arm, um, there's the bolt there. We want to get the bolt as far forwards as possible, because what that does is that pushes against the cam and that will tuck the rudder under the boat as much as possible. So that is how you are going to reduce the load on your steering the most. Um, it might require some new parts like on a Hobie 16 or any Hobie replacing the cams. They're the plastic bits that um, this plate locks into like that. Replacing the cams is going to help. Um, but generally pushing that as far forwards as possible is really going to help. Back in the day, before I started sailing Hobies, when I was sailing a Dart 18, my rudder system was so badly smashed up that I would actually sail, like if this is the rudder stock, with a piece of elastic, thick elastic, like six, seven mil, uh, going around the back of the rudder blade. And I'd absolutely crank that elastic on to pull the rudder blades into the boat. And that way the boat would actually feel all right to sail and not <laughs> like that amount of load. So I have been there. I know what you're going through. Um, also, it's not good for the boat to sail with this massive amount of load on the rudders because that load is all being taken by many things. So if there's a load of ro load on the rudders, the first thing is the rudder blades are under much more load. So you could actually damage your rudder blade. Um, if you're sailing with a white knight rudder blade on a Hobie 16, those are the ones that say carbon reinforced um, and you're sailing with a lot of pressure. That is when you're going to break your rudder blade. Um, so also that load is going to go up through the rudder stock and into the, um, the pin. Um, and that is going to cause more load on the gudgeons, which might make your gudgeons come loose. Like we've already talked about in today's Q&A um, and then more load on the back of the boat, more load everywhere. You're not going to sail as fast. It's not going to be as fun. So let's get those bad boys tucked under there. Nice. And goodbye to Toot at this point. Um, great to have you with us, Toot. Always a pleasure. And I hope you're off to um, have a look at your getaway and put some racing stripes on the hulls ready for the getaway challenge. All right, next in the preloaded questions, this is from Jamie Bravo, who says, looking for um, a mast float alternative to the Hobie Bob for a Hobie 14. All right. Um, oh, and Jamie adds, uh, he's pumped out on the T-shirts and beanies that he's had from TotalJoyRider.com. Hats like this, shirts like this, totaljoyrider.com. Um, yes, yeah, so alternatives to the Hobie masthead float 
Now, unfortunately, I've got I've got limited um, knowledge on this topic, but the one that springs to mind. In fact, two things that spring to mind. The first one is uh, from the brand Crew Saver, who make uh, the buoyancy aids and life jackets. They actually make a um, masthead float, which is kind of like an inflatable sack. And the one you'd want is 40 litres. And what you do, it's not quite so elegant, though. This is the problem. What you do is when you put when you attach your mainsail to the main halyard, you also attach this masthead float, which kind of is about the size of a pillow. And you pull that to the top of the mast with your sail. And that means it's not up there all the time. Um, they work really well and you can take the air out afterwards and you can store it indoors so it lasts longer. Um, so that is option A for the alternative. But what I would look at, if I wanted perhaps not complete, I don't even know if this is possible, but this is an idea that I've got. Um, if um, if you wanted your boat not to invert as quickly, but perhaps it would still invert sometimes. And in fact, saying I don't know if this is possible, we did actually used to do this. I used to work at the um, at what is now called Wind Sport in the UK, uh, teaching sailing on Dart 18s. Um, at the top of the sail, we actually got the sail maker to stitch in a big foam panel in the top of the sail. So it's this is actually going to be less wind resistance than any other option of masthead float. It might not ever, it might not stop the boat inverting completely, but it is certainly going to reduce the chance of inversion. Um, but that is a good option if you can find a sail maker to do that kind of job. And then what to put in the sail would be kind of similar to the foam that you get in a buoyancy aid, which I'm sure uh, can be sourced. All right, so uh, next one in the preloaded. We've got two more in the preloaded, and then we're back into the live chat. So if you're in the live chat, waiting for me to come on to the live chat, stay tuned. So this is a question from Doby, who, um, uh, just I've summarized the question and called it the wetsuit buyer's guide. OK, so there's many different types of wetsuit you could go for. I'm just going to go through this at a reasonable pace. Um, so depending on the temperature of the water and the temperature of the air. Um, so if 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 you're going to wear a wetsuit in the warmest conditions, um, the smallest one is what's called a short john. If a wetsuit is called a john, so it seems. Um, it means it's got no arms, so it's sleeveless. And because it's a short john, it means the... Um, it's a short John. So um, that is what I wear in the summer here because I always, even when it's really hot, I always like to have something on under my shorts just because otherwise I feel the trapeze harness just cuts in a little bit too much and um, it's not as comfortable. And it is nice just to have that little bit of protection. Um, then Moving up from the short John is the shorty, which would be short. The bottom half would be the same, except it has sleeves as well. Uh, the shorty would be for, again, sailing in warm conditions. Uh, again, we've got our knees exposed here. So moving on from the shorty, 
if you're worried about having your knees exposed because of this wear on the trampoline, then I feel a great option. And again, this is something that I use a lot is the long john. And all wetsuits which cover the knees will generally have some sort of uh, reinforcement on the knees uh, because it's a high wear place. So the long john is a great option, usually something like two mil thick. Um, and it really does make a big difference, perhaps if you've got quite warm water, but um, there's some wind chill or if you're sailing somewhere like in the lakes in Italy, like Lake Garda, where you've got a really warm, the air is really warm, but the water is melted snow. Yes. Uh, so having something a bit more than a shorty is nice if it's going to be windy. Now, with the long john, a strategy is to combine it with something else. So, um, what I generally combine mine with is like a wetsuit top or what's also known as a hot top. So a wetsuit top would be about um, two mil rubber, um, but the wetsuit top and the long john really does make you as warm as toast as long as it's um, not freezing cold. So probably 15 degrees plus, that is a very good uh, choice there. The other choice in the combining things is to have a spray top. So a spray top is basically a waterproof top, um, which if you put it on over the top of anything at all, it's going to boost that up one notch up the warmth scale. But by having a combination of whatever wetsuit you've got, if you've also got a spray top or a hot top, it makes it that much more versatile. So you can like uh, mix and match depending on the temperature. All right, I just saw in the live chat, um, there's a brand called Jet Pilot, uh, which might be an Australian brand, I don't know but they do great wetsuits for water sports. All right. So, um, yeah, what's next on the list? So next up from the Long John. By the way, I have done a video on this, which I think I called it What to Wear. One up from the Long John is the summer suit. Now, the summer suit. Oh, dear is basically a long legged suit with short arms like that. And what you can actually get to upgrade your summer suit for more warmth is you can just get the sleeves as extras. So then if it's a little bit colder, then you could just put on the extra sleeves as well. But the summer suit, another great option. Um, it's just nice to have your arms out if it's a, if it's a nice day, I find. Uh, on from the summer suit, then we're on to full suits, which are, of course, the full wet suit. And then that's when we really start talking about the thickness. So wet suit thicknesses come generally in two numbers. So the, the lightest full suit would generally be a three, two. And what the numbers mean is the thickness of neoprene rubber. So that would be three mil rubber, probably around this area, and then two mil everywhere else. Um, and that means that you haven't got rubber that's too thick over the arms and the lower legs, which you're gonna have to do a lot of movement. Um, the next up from three two would be four three. Um, and then the next up from four, three, and this would be for pretty cold conditions would be a five, four. 
Now, the thing that really makes a difference with wetsuits is quality. Because if you've got a really good quality 3-2, this is actually going to be warmer than a cheap 4-3. But with the 3-2, the benefit, rather than just getting the cheaper one, is that the thinner rubber neoprene is actually much more flexible and it's not going to feel as restrictive. So there you go. So invest a bit in the wetsuit. Um, and then with the wetsuits, you'll find these days, there's a lot of wetsuits which have the seal, the zip is actually in the front like this. Now, these can be absolute murder to get on and off. And I would say the wetsuits with this sort of seal are more for people doing sports where they're going to be in the water a lot more than what we're talking about, such as um, windsurfers, surfers, bodyboarders, kite surfers, people like that. They're more appropriate to have the zip in the front because they're going to be in the water a lot more. Whereas we can definitely live with having the zip at the back, which does make it so much easier to put it on. Then just to run through what quality brands can we mention? There's ones which come from surfing like O'Neill, Billabong, Rip Curl, Quicksilver, XL, Hurley, um, Gull are covering all of the sports. Uh, then the ones from windsurfing, kite surfing, uh, from Ion, Neil Pride, Pro Limit, Mystic. I personally use Mystic. That is a Dutch brand, very good quality. And then the sailing specific ones from Gill, Magic Marine, Musto, and Forward WIP. Lots of options there. Yeah, so hope that answers the question on the topic of wetsuit choice. All right, I'm just going to dive back into the live chat before going on to the final preloaded question which is from Andre, the last one. So um, I think, right, Jens says, I was riding a Top Cat K2 on one side of the boat. The trapeze pulls me very aggressively towards the front. Other side was normal. Yeah, that's a bit odd, isn't it? Um, what could you check? I, I just don't want to state the obvious here, but the first thing is to do, look up the mast and just check that it hasn't actually done a circuit around the rest of the rigging and it's actually pulling from the other side. Um, now, why would that pull you aggressively towards the front? So there's that. Look up the mast. Look at where your trapeze shock cord is coming from. But the trapeze shock cord shouldn't be so tight but you feel it pulling aggressively. Yeah, I'm really a bit stuck there, Jens, I'm afraid. Um, perhaps if you can send me a picture, oh, if, it, if it's a boat you've got access to, send me a picture of the boat and I might be able to see, but I really can't say unless it's because on one tack, the trim was different to the other. Um, yeah, strange. No, can't think of anything there. Sorry about that, Jens. What's wrong with it? I don't know. All right. So Jens says, uh, knee pads, never without them when I go to Greece. Yeah. And what's good is if you are going to go on a sailing holiday, buy a good pair of knee pads. And if you live somewhere where you're going to wear a full wetsuit the rest of the time, those knee pads are going to last you a long time. So there you go. All right. So I think there's a little bit of what boats have you got going on in the live chat with um, Ryan, I think, has, has got quite a few. Um, Toot's got a few. <laughs> All right. Declan also says, actually, this is a good one. Um, who is planning to go to Wildwind this year? Put your dates in the Discord. All right, there you go. You can use this thing for any sort of chat, 
but let's keep the there's some servers on there about um some topics about the exchange scheme uh who's got a boat and wants people to come and sail with them who wants someone to take them out on their boat if we keep those just for those things then on the general one let's keep that general nice all right someone linked me over the discord server here you go ryan coming up there it is uh yeah so last preloaded question sorry i went a bit i got a bit uh distracted there so this is from andre who sails with max on lake simsi germany he says and this is one of my favorite questions how did you put the speed indicator on the left side of the film? Um, yeah, so most of my videos have got telemetry on them, which is like the gauges that we put on. And all GoPros, this is actually a GoPro Hero 5. This is going back a few years now. But all GoPro cameras since the GoPro Hero 5 have an inbuilt GPS, which means after you've finished filming, as long as you've got your GPS switched on, um, you can then add telemetry. Um, but unfortunately, the GoPro app is pretty poor. Uh, it only does miles per hour and or I think you can do kilometers as well. But everybody knows for sailing it has to be knots and also you can only use the telemetry from the gopro app if you do it through your telephone which might mean if you've been sailing for half an hour that's going to be probably about eight gigabytes of footage that you're putting through your telephone probably even more uh, to put the telemetry on and for me that is a non-starter so what I use, and I've tried so many different um, telemetry apps on the computer, um, and the one that I've ended up um, just using exclusively is called Telemetry Overlay. You'll see a link to Telemetry Overlay in any of my videos uh, in the description. And um, it does cost some money. You have to buy it. But it's the only one that immediately it's very easy to use and straight away it looks absolutely fantastic and there's more gauges available than the ones that you see me using i generally only use one or two gauges but there's a ton of gauges there if you want to get telemetry overlay um then um there is a discount code uh, which I can't remember what it is, but it's, again, in the description of most videos that I put out. It will be there. Put in the discount code. You get a discount. I get a little bit of cash towards my new computer from them. But I do genuinely absolutely love this app and I use it all the time. In fact, you're not going to believe it. But if you don't know what to do once this is finished, if you go, I need more of that. English guy shouting at me. Um, then I've just had go out on my second channel called Biking with Joyrider TV, a video where I'm comparing different types of bike and how fast they are using telemetry overlay, uh, doing e-bike, fat bike, normal bike around a track. So you'll find that on Biking with Joyrider TV. Right. So there we go, Andre. I hope that helped. Telemetry overlay is the key. Um, all right. So I've got Edward on board. Hello, Edward. Says, just love neoprene sleeves on my knees. OK, because uh, the wind and water combined freezes them. OK, so for the cold rather than the abrasion. All right. And Yen says, I have different name on this cord because i use it for gaming you have the same nickname in youtube and discord okay there we go 
All right, then, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button before you leave. Uh, that just really helps for this to be seen by more people. Get involved on the Discord server. Continue having a chat over there. Maybe while you watch the uh, video on biking with Joyrider TV. And so what is he doing? Stick to the sailing. Um, but anyway, thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you soon with some more, as always, on Joyrider TV. Uh, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. So thanks very much. And thank you. <laughs>